John, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. John, good to see you. Likewise. What have you been uh, doing to save the world in the last few weeks since I saw you? Oh, drinking too much red wine. Nice. <laughs> Love it. So, I, I, I went out last night and um, we've got neighbours two doors down who are lovely people. And, uh, and we went paddling down the river on Saturday down the, yeah, we're 30 kilometres upstream on the Yarra River. Nice. And, uh, and it's beautiful paddling. You must do it one time. Um, like we see platypus and all that sort of stuff up there. It's lovely. Awesome. And uh, So we did that on Saturday and they asked us over for dinner on Saturday, but we were going out. So we went there last night on the condition that we'd get there early and leave by seven. So at 10.30, I was having my last bottle of uh, red wine and... Uh, Anyhow, so I was a bit shabby this morning. But, yeah. <laughs> nice. Good. We like shabby podcasties. <laughs> exactly. You're looking good. <laughs> How have you guys been? You good? Yeah. yeah, we're good. Yeah. Basically, we're starting off with our podcast of what the year and the world is going to be like in the year 2050. So can you give me three words that come to mind for the year 2050? Could be emotional or industrial, anything. Oh, um, three words. Uh... Populated, um, considered, um, and caring. Awesome. Interesting. Okay. Why considered? Because we have to. We have to be. Uh, a, a, I think we're. You know, as a society, we're starting to consider um, our impact. Um, and in fact, I probably should have said responsible, but considered will do. I think we just have an obligation to make sure that uh, while we're on the planet, that we are more considered and more responsible um, for the for what we do and, and for what impact that we have. Yeah, I agree. Interesting. I agree as well. The, um, what Just what's the image in the background? Is that, I quite like it, actually. I'm just thinking, <laughs> who, who, where did you get it made? <laughs> That's, uh, that's Blake. Oh, there you go. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So we, we normally have heaps of shoes and all that stuff up, but we're actually transitioning our office from a subsidiary into a distributor. And so I've actually packed up all the samples. But that's Blake on his uh, on one of his first giving trips, giving a pair of shoes away to kids in there around the world. So there you go. Oh, that's sweet. So, John, you've been involved with Tom's for how long now? So good, buddy. You just break up. Oh, that's right. How long have you been involved with Tom's? Um, I uh, I found out about them on November the eleventh, two thousand and ten, um, and not that I'm great with dates, but I just have the email trail. <laughs> and and literally, uh, someone rang me up because I've been selling shoes for a long period of time, and they were just writing this article about Tom's and said it sounds awesome. And obviously, you being a sort of a, a shoe dog or whatever. <laughs> Um, you, you can give me some background on it and quite embarrassingly I've never heard of them um, so I, I didn't add a lot of depth to that conversation um, but I did, I, I jumped on mine and, and looked up Tom's and, cause he, I, and I said to him, I said no, they give away parachutes for everyone they sell, that sounds incredible, is it true? And he said I don't know, that's why I'm ringing you up and, uh, <laughs> so I sort of, you know, is Tom's true Google and all that sort of stuff and I wrote to them literally like two hours later and said uh, I have to do this brand and it took me from then until January 2012 um, to, to come on board because they were going through a huge uh, growth stage at the time. And uh, yes, I've been with them uh, six years in January. Actually, the, the day I finish is uh, the day before six years. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> Ripped you off a day. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> but, uh, but no, look, it's been, it's an incredible um, business and it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really excited actually to be moving on, albeit that it wasn't what I planned, um, because I think, um, you know, life's just about an accumulation of, uh, of, of knowledge, um, and hopefully the next step is uh, a combination of everything you've learned to, to make a, a better impact or, or to, to be more thoughtful. And I think Tom's has just been a lovely uh, stepping stone for me to sort of do the next thing. Um, so I've, uh, as I say, initially when I first got the phone call, I sat for like thirty seconds, and you go get on with it, you know. It's, um, so what, why did they change the distributorship? We got a uh, consultant in to look at our global business and and to uh, to make sure we were being um, prudent um, with our money. Um, yeah. So basically, cost cutting ex 
exercise, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's a nice way to put it. Um, and they just sort of basically, you know, the, the traditional model of, of business, global business is to get distributors yeah. uh, and to, uh, to give them the opportunity to represent the brand. The benefit of distributors is from a, uh, a cost viewpoint, it's quite minimal um, because they buy the stock off you. Um, they buy the stock uh, as it finishes the factory, so you get all your money up front. So there's some distinct advantages of having distributors. Yeah. I was a subsidiary because I convinced them six years ago that um, it's better to own your brand. Um, and, and, and I also I, I firmly believe that the, the Australian consumer uh, is less likely and more reluctant to pay a premium just because we live in Australia mm-hmm. uh, than, than we were uh, in 2000. In 2000, I had a brand called And One, which was a basketball company, and I could sell a hundred dollar US shoe for two hundred bucks, no problems at all, um, and no one really cared. Uh, yeah, because you know this internet thing was just starting, uh, mm-hmm. and it's sort of it's take it's got a bit of traction since then. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and so obviously, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have a global pricing matrix, which makes sense, um, it, it's, I think it's tough, you know, and I, I believe that, you know, every global company can't use the excuse anymore, oh, well, we have distributors, which is another profit center, so yeah. uh, we're sorry when you get off the plane in LA that everything's half price. Because there's mixed thought in the fashion world, isn't there? Like you got, you know, Lululemon saying we need to own our own stores. You got Icebreaker saying we need to own our own stores. And then you got even Tom's World in Austin. I don't know if they still have it. They have their own cafe. And so you suddenly have a coffee and look at shoes. Um, I don't know if you even bought a cafe into Australia. Like, and so you almost got two models, which I guess like guys like Seth Gooden said that, you know, extra valued goods could become more of an experiential thing. And that creates the whole value and people will pay a premium for it versus just being another average product and being distributed, right? Sure. It's, uh, well, look, and, and um, I, I think as, as there is in business, as there is in life, there's many, there's many paths you can take yeah. and you can, it can lead to success either way. Yeah. Um, and I think there, you know, I can argue if I'm in the debating team why a subsidiary makes sense, but if you chuck me the, the debating team of why a distributor makes sense, I'll, I'll give it a crack as well, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. You know, I could win either. It's nice. I, I think that they both have they both uh, have distinct. I, to be totally frank, I think the lovely thing about us appointing distributors, of which I'm I'm very much a part of before I leave. Yeah. Um, we're very close. We had uh, meetings in Hong Kong last week, and we're we're literally sort of weeks away from signing. And I think they they will bring a lot more to the business than what I would have. Yeah. Um, and like capital. Yeah, um, and and, uh, and all that which we hadn't done um, as a global company. Mm-hmm. So you know, there are there are there's positives and negatives. Yeah, as there you know, whenever you hear anyone saying this is the only way to do something, you say, yeah, <laughs> probably other ways to do it. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Mm. And so, do you think Tom started the whole movement towards this? You know, consciousness and considered and. I think it, it, it's it certainly had a, a profound impact. I yeah, think, you know, eleven years ago. In 2006, when Blake, I think that the lovely thing about the story for me, there's, there's, there's so many things to talk about, but one of them is that Blake uh, helped distribute shoes to 250 kids. Yeah. Uh, so he wasn't sitting there thinking, how do I make a dent in the universe? How do I create a global company? He basically gave shoes to 250 kids and thought, actually, just by giving him one pair of shoes isn't all that sustainable yeah. uh, and, and not that thoughtful. Yeah. So I thought about it a bit and thought, well, actually, if I, if I incorporate the, you know, the whole Tom story, the, the first pair, into the, the second pair into the first pair price, went back and sold some to my mates, sold 500, I could give you know, these kids two pairs of shoes a year. Um, and basically it was by thinking about how do I do something good for um, something I can influence today. Yeah. Um, and from that, you know, we've now given over you know, over 80 million kids around the world have got shoes from Tom's. Well, it's amazing. Just the, I'm going to carry on this story because I guess like from there you've got these thank you water like companies who are giving product away, right? You've got Charity Water in US, which maybe came over as a spark from Tom's. I don't know. Um, what do you think the bad thing with things with the model are? Where, well, like, where do you think it fails? Especially when you bring in a thank you sort of company as well. And across all yeah. these, and I'm sure there's millions of others who are giving stuff away now. I think I think 
when you give, you have to be very cautious. Um, I, I don't think that's a negative. I cautious of? It, it, yeah, you have to be very conscious of the people that you're giving to. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I think if you give someone too much, there's the ability to, to hurt them. Yeah. Um, and to make to, to to take out any motivation to do stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, anyone, and this is not a Tom's comment. This is anyone that's involved in in thinking about giving back and helping people. Um, it, it's really really important that the integrity of that give is is needed mm-hmm. and and wanted. Yeah. And, and is continually assessed because selling shoes and selling eyewear and selling what Tom's does is a very easy process. It's been going on since Adam was a boy, and you sort of go, we know that process. But to actually, uh, and and one of the, I think the smartest thing that Blake did um, early on in the business was to allow NGOs to take control of the give. Um, And we now deal with over 100 NGOs. Um, And they're they're at the coalface every day. They're they're, they're talking to the people that need help um, and are in by far the best position to do that. So um, I think whenever... Uh, you, you set up a, a, a program that helps others. You just got to make sure that the integrity and the legitimacy of the give is always there. Otherwise, it just becomes a, a bit of a marketing ploy. Yeah, you know? it needs to have that collaborative sense with the people on the ground, and then also the I guess the communities themselves are a big one because they need to take ownership over their lives and what they're doing day to day. So if they don't feel it and they feel it's a bit of a uh, you know, wish wash or or just thrown over them, they're not going to want it either, are they? Exactly right. It's and right. so, did, did Tom's ever fall into that position where they'd find the communities didn't want them, or look, we're guided by the NGO, so okay. I've got no doubt that, that we have service some communities that we don't anymore. Yeah. Um, so it's not just a matter of need; it's a matter of also being able to uh, to provide the answers as well. And so, and I'll give you an example. Um, I was in a remote indigenous community um, before we started giving shoes in Australia and I went and saw the principal of the local school and I went to talk to the kids and um, and so there was no doubt in my mind there was a need for yeah. the shoes and so I rang up Tom's the next day and said hey this you know, I met mean, this 150 kids they're awesome uh, can you send me some shoes please and they said no no that's sort of not the way it works so uh, we <laughs> We sort of have to, you know, sit down with an NGO. We have to see if they service the community and do all that sort of stuff. And actually, when we went through the process of, of getting Save the Children to distribute shoes in Australia, it took 18 months to dot the I's, cross the T's. Um, Crazy. Which, uh, at the time, because I'm like I am, I was uh, slightly frustrated with the process because I wanted to do it yesterday. Yeah. But um, I, I can get run over by a bus uh, today, which I, I hope I don't, obviously. Um, but the giving would continue it's not based on my passion it's yeah. just based on the NGO's ability to say is there a need can can we distribute it and uh, and is it sustainable and if if we took all those boxes well then we give That's but, great. I think it's sort of I think it's, it's nice from a business viewpoint just to make sure the integrity is always there rather than like I, you're both passionate people as I am and you mm-hmm. sort of you, you come across the need to think, oh my god I need to do something right now and I and, and it's I think one of the learnings as I get older is that you can't do everything yourself eh? it's yeah like when Definitely. you do you set up a totally unsustainable business model yeah which is probably a nice segue into um, save our souls <laughs> 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 yes we're getting to that well in terms of Tom's though do you think that sort of business model and Tom's itself will be around in the year 2050 I've got no doubt it will. It's um, and I think the potential for Tom's. I get I get very excited thinking about uh, if if it remains true and loyal to its purpose, which is to to use business as a force for good um, and to make the world a better place through its business. The potential is huge um, because Tom's is limited by uh, the authenticity of our give yeah. to a large extent. It's not a uh, it's not an athletic brand. It's not a fashion brand. It's sort of, uh, and so people, if we take people on a journey and they they use Tom's as a vehicle to make the world a better place, in 2050, you know, I would fly in a Tom's plane. Yeah. I, yeah. I would have a Tom's credit card. Um, I would. Uh, I would. To give stuff any, back. I would align myself with any business. Where we're, uh, you're giving stuff back, you mean? You're using Tom's as an analogy to like, I buy a flight and the flight's given to someone else. Yeah, or, or just or I, Tom's I, private jet. Yeah, yeah or, or, or not necessarily. 
necessarily a one for one. Okay. But I think uh, it, I think the lovely thing about when Tom started is that's so simple. Yeah. Like, I buy a pair of shoes, they get a pair of shoes. But I think as we evolve, um, as business evolves, not only Tom's. Yeah. You have to make sure that you remain relevant and you evolve. Um, so I think the one for one model, there's no doubt internally that's evolving into different things. But don't you think in like 250, which is, you were saying is 30 years away, like 3D printing is probably going to be extended by that point. Like what, and maybe it comes back to save your souls in a second is like, can you not build a shoe that can last forever? And can you not at least build a system in the middle where anyone can fix a shoe regardless of where they are and have it last forever in that instance? Or someone can actually almost print or make a shoe in a very simple process anywhere in the world and the giving maybe then becomes 3D printers or something related to that or designs which is a open source design which means you don't even need to ship a shoe or need a distributor by that point so they're irrelevant sure. um, yeah, no, lucky I, you I, got I, out now <laughs> good timing 3D printers are really um, you know it, it's, it's, it's happening now yeah. Sort of go, but it, it's it's quite hard to do. It's quite expensive. But you know, maybe in, in time you'll be buying patterns off people that you like. Yeah, and you're printing them at home. Um, and, and are so, you guys even considering that, or is that not really in the pipeline for a Tom's at the moment? I, I think, uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't know. You, yeah, you'd have to ask the leadership. I would think, though, being selling shoes, you sort of go. I, I know that the likes of Nike and Adidas and all that certainly uh, would be heading down that track and you sort of go and it, and it's not the distance future it's here now it's just how, how do you make it commercial and, and, and how does it look yeah you know, what is it how does it make sense so I think um, yeah, I think we'll see that before you know 2050 I guess it's you know we, we have to come we have to come understand that we, we if you keep using finite product infinitely you're going to run out yeah no, I'm not I'm not a smart bloke, but I can work that way out. <laughs> yeah. And you go, so I think some, sometime between now and 2050, we have to say, okay, we have to be more responsible and we have to be more caring. And so how do we reuse? And things like uh, 3D printing, I think, are part of the answer. They're not the total answer, but I yeah. think it's, as always, it's a combination of things to make, to make it better. Yeah, I think this is a good segue as well because... <laughs> Um, I listened to Blake's interview with Claire Press on her podcast, Wardrobe Crisis, and he was talking about Tom's and how, you know, while they're uh, sustainable in a lot of areas, the environmental part probably isn't there at the moment, and there's more that they could be doing in that area. So talk to us about your project and your company that you started, Save Our Souls. Yeah, so that's salt. So that that started when I was uh, with Nike. I was I had a five year deal with Nike that I looked after their outdoor brand, and um, so which I did. It was called ACG. Is when I was a retailer, it was my favourite part of Nike. It was sort of uh, pretty cool and pretty um, technical, and it was nice. Anyhow, they gave it to me, and uh, and and but it was a, a bit of a uh, a moving target, may I say. Uh, that was when they were doing SB and they had sort of a, a winter range and then they had ACG. So it was sort of a bit of a problem child. And um, so after uh, 18 months, I sort of, I, I, I stuck with it. I did it for five years, but I started chairing their environmental group uh, in in Australia, uh, which was called the Green Team. Um, so I changed the name straight away. Um, <laughs> so I, I just think that's very yesterday Um and uh, so we call it the considered team, which is a Nike sort of word that they use when they look at their apparel to, to do have the best possible outcomes, both from a product and planet viewpoint. Um, and uh, and so I, through that, I, I found out about Nike Reuse the Shoe. And uh, so I started that in Australia and New Zealand and uh, and funded it. And uh, and it was it was great. And sort of through the education of thinking about shoes and all that. Just to put uh, the problem in perspective, you know, the in Australia and New Zealand, we import 100 million pairs of shoes every year into Australia. Um, and if they're not in your cupboard, they've gone to landfill. And you go, well, that's, that, like, there's no other word for it. That sucks. And you go, and I've been selling shoes now for 30 odd years, so albeit that I'm not responsible for 100 million pair a year, um, I've, I've been responsible for some of that. And you go, well, if I've got the opportunity to, uh, to make a difference, uh, not to fix the world's problems, obviously, but just to have an impact of where I can uh, have an input. 
well then I'll do it. So well, that's why we started that. And I sort of and so we we would get forty foot containers, and once they were full, we'd send them back to America, and uh, and they would recycle them in America. And I was when I went to America, I went to their factories, had a look how it was done. It was a fairly simple process. Um, well simple for me but sort of I tend to fly 30,000 feet so don't get down into the night the bolts. I thought oh we could do that in Australia and um, so we then uh, I started looking of how to make the, the the system better you know it was it was better than sending them to landfill putting them in a container and sending them to America but it seemed better to just recycle them in Australia and so um, I, I met a guy uh, that recycled tires and uh, and we went through the process of you know can we recycle shoes and um, and so we started doing that in Broad Meadows in, in Melbourne, and then I left. You know, my five years was up. I sort of uh, I, I kept chairing their environmental group for about another eighteen months, but I wasn't earning an income from them. And then I thought, well, I, I'm not going to fund Nike. You know, they've got plenty of money, a lot more money than I'll ever have. Um, so I started Save Our Souls, um, and that also allowed Nike to continue uh, recycling um, because it wasn't. Uh, a Nike initiative, it was a John L. Lead initiative, I guess. But talking about setting up a sustainable business model, I think it's really important to just to share that, you know, I, I'm, I'm passionate about this and you sort of go, okay, well, I'll get shoes and um, and you've got to remember to throw a pair of shoes to your bit at home. The environmental cost is significant, but the financial cost to you is nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and because, as a society, we don't factor in environmental costs, unfortunately. Yeah, they're not those; they're intangible costs. We don't ever think or see them, really. Yeah, so people just, you know, blinded by them. They're certainly there, aren't they? Oh, yeah. definitely. But so we have to then. So what we're asking the consumer is: Oh, now there's a cost, financial cost, in looking after the planet. And uh, some people go, I'm really prepared to do that. And others go, hey, listen, you know, money's pretty tight. I'm not prepared to do that. So you have to try and work out uh, to keep your cost to a minimum, which the way I did that is that I unloaded the containers with my wife on the weekends. Um, and I would throw them on into the machine for free, you know, and all that. So, so we sort of, but then you go, well, um, you know, I'm 56 now, not that I'm old. But you go, I can't keep throwing them in a container by myself. There has to be a better system um, because if I do get hit by a bus this afternoon, I want um, Save Our Souls to continue. And to be honest, I'm probably not exactly there yet. You know, it's still half on, I, I have to sort of keep the, the, the wheel greased. Um, but I'm, I'm very cognizant that I have to uh, create a system that's, that's self-running. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a really, it's an important problem. You say 100 million pairs of shoes, we probably recycled sort of 60, 70,000 pair last year. It's, we're just sort of scraping the surface. And, um, and, and, and again, all this, the, the product that we make shoes out of is, is, um, is not infinite product. You know, it's sort of, oh, I'm sorry. Bloody hell, John. I think so, that was on the rules. Turn your yeah. phone off. Or <laughs> <laughs> someone trying to recycle their shoes. Do you think, you know how, um, well, for tyres, for example, you know, you said you spoke to a tyre recycler and I've worked in that industry around tyre recycling before and looking at the legislation of that in Australia and we pay a cost when we go and have our tyres changed over. You know, it can yep. be anywhere up to five bucks a tyre to pay for the recycling cost of that tyre. Mm -hmm. So it gets picked up and from that um, from that store and taken out to the recycler. Do you think a levy or a premium when you purchase something could be a way to offset the recycling of it? Uh, absolutely. It, it's um, and, and you're right, in the tyre industry, but it also in, um, in the um, e-waste industry, you know, there's a... Um, and, and, Pretty much coming out of Europe, you know, that's where we, that's where it tends to come from, is that there's, you know, a product stewardship cost at the front end to enable the back end, mm -hmm. um, which I think is great and certainly a stepping stone. It doesn't mean that it's, it's the right, the process is then always correct. No, it doesn't mean it's actually going to be recycled. Could still end up in landfill and cost you five bucks more. <laughs> exactly right. It's, um, and I think one of the if we if we go back to 2050, one of the you know the criteria that you would hope is that when we import product in, into Australia, and it's past its life cycle, it's our obligation 
to keep it in Australia. It's our obligation to use the product because um, what we do at the moment, and this includes ties, we have a, you know, we have a, 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 I'm sure in the UN there's, there's a, a, an agreement between all companies that you're not allowed to transport waste. Um, yeah, the Basel to, Convention. Yeah, so there, there you go. It's, <laughs> uh, and, but if you cut a tyre in uh, four bits, it's no longer a tyre, it's mm-hmm. now rubber. Yeah. Um, and so most of our ties in Australia go back to uh, China and India. And Vietnam. And Vietnam and get burnt. Yeah, oh, in really? the backyards. Yeah, that's Crazy. that process that I worked in. I worked with the Boomerang Alliance and I went to Vietnam and documented, recorded and, and made some um, small videos about the tyre process and how... Australia was sending all our waste tires to Vietnam and people were burning them in their backyards. So the human health problems were astronomical. And then also the tires were sitting around like um, artificial water receptors because they were full tires and they were collecting water. And then the rise and rate of dengue fever was going through the roof because all these uh, mosquitoes were just breeding and like in people's backyards. So it was super sad. Yeah. It's, it, and it's, it is super sad, and you sort of, and I don't understand um, how, as a society, we accept it. Um, and I, I think sometimes it's just through ignorance, and there's probably no excuse for that. Being, you know, you can type anything on Google, and it'll tell you what, what what's going on to some extent. But I think there's we the the idea is that we are a global community, and we're a global village. Um, and just because someone's burning off in a street that you can't see, it's still the air that I breathe. It's still the oceans I swim in. And, and you sort of, so we have a, I, I think there's an obligation by 2050 to be true global citizens um, and to, you know, which is really easy to say, but very, very hard to do. I think one of the challenges of that is not only to look after the environment better, but also to accept diversity better um, and to truly embrace diversity um, as, as long as, I guess, you we're all sitting at the same table because it depends who sets the uh, the parameters of what diversity is allowed. Uh, is a really interesting subject, I think. It's um, but um, anyhow, I, I, I digress. Do you think you could build it? Like I know in the tire industry, didn't they at some point realise that? Or no, it was Nike, wasn't it? That certain rubbers could be last forever, but people weren't buying shoes, so they actually designed the shoes to only last a year. You'd know this better than me, but I have heard somewhere that the shoes actually designed to last a year to, to consume shoes, we, we could actually build a shoe that would last a long time. Yeah, I hadn't, I, look, I think it's fair to say as an a, as a umbrella comment that planned obsolescence is built into a, a lot of product. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the frustrating thing is that uh, not so much, I, I don't think, footwear because we just throw that away to a large extent, um, but you you know, if you if you have a dishwasher that breaks down, it's cheaper to go out and buy a brand new one. To get it is today. Yeah. Thanks to Kmart. Oh, that, yeah, and it's like the same as a you know printer for your computer. Oh yeah. It's yeah. usually cheaper just to go buy a new one than it is to get the inks refilled or buy new ones. It's mental. It is crazy. It, it's funny. It, it is exactly. We, we moved offices last year, and the printer I had, which I had from home which was a very, like, it cost me an enormous amount of money, but it was like 14 years old. Yeah. So, the printers have come a, a fair way in that. And I actually, I went to Officeworks uh, reluctantly because I had to buy a new computer, and it cost me uh, $380, and it does, it, like, everything. It's wireless, it's color. It's yeah, yeah. But then the, the, uh, the color printer I needed to do refills, and it was almost exactly the same price as buying a new printer, just the refill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it actually worked out cheaper if I bought a whole new printer with the ink in it. <laughs> and you just go, oh my God, what a sad society we are. And I think that's, it, it's sort of, we've got to go beyond, uh, it's cheaper doing it this way. Because the, as I say, all we factor in as a society is the financial cost. Well, and if we start factoring in the environmental cost, it would scare all of us, mm-hmm. as it should. A lot of a lot of people say that oh you know consciousness will change and people will start caring and that will drive change right. Do you think that's true or do you actually think it actually has to be something designed from the companies on the offset or does everyone suddenly become more conscious after by two thousand fifty everyone's thinking I care I'm going to walk down the street and drop my shoes off at this recycling centre and I am going to go get a refill. I, I think they um, I think they. Uh... I think people today care. I don't yeah. think the care factor is going to go up. I just think that we, 
as a society, it's not a, 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 it's not on our radar because for a lot of reasons. I think I don't think the government um, take it seriously enough. I don't yeah. think that they show any leadership in this area. Um, and I'll give it again. I'll, I'll just go back to um, uh, to save our souls. I know I had a meeting with a, a government minister years ago. And basically, was saying, "Hey, look, you now we can get old shoes, and we can make them, you know, matting out of them, and uh, we yeah. can actually make uh, new sports grounds out of old sports shoes." Nice story. <laughs> and he said, oh, "That's awesome." You know, he said, "How much money do you want?" I said, "Actually, I don't want any money because um, you know, Kathy and I, Kathy and I work for free. You know, it's fine." <laughs> I said, "But what I want you to do is I want you to change the legislation so when you buy a rubber compound, that there's a percentage of recycled from Australia in it." And, and his words were, and I won't comment who it was, and it doesn't really matter, but it, it's, I think it's the attitude of the government is, mate, I can give you money. Got, you know, no worries, I can give you Change legislation. Poof. Now, we're going to election in 18 months, and it wouldn't go through anyhow, and it, just, and it was almost put in the too hard basket. Yeah. And you think there has to be... Um, the money is our money, by the way, you know, yeah. the government people. Uh, we give it to you. Um, so but to give some back is fine, but I think there has to be a commitment to say regardless of whether it's Liberal, Labor or whoever it is, just to make a commitment to start treating finite product infinitely and, and making some allowance for that. Um, so I think, yeah, the government... So I think people do care, but we're sceptical. Um, and, and it's also, you know, it's a... It, it, I think the, the radar is there, but you sort of... My first reaction about Tom's was, is that true? Yeah. Not, oh, my God, isn't that lovely? And so, so I think we've, we've got a healthy scepticism and we're not sure how to make the world a better place. Yep. In my mind, I'm very clear that it'll be business that makes the world a better place and we vote every day with our dollars and I give my dollars to people that I think are doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there just has to be a stronger belief that businesses aren't out there to get you, that some businesses out there are there to change the world. Yeah. And they, and they, and they need people to support them. Well, on that topic of legislation, though, having that top-down approach with legislation enacted for certain businesses to do a better thing or the right thing, that will definitely help, though, won't it, to educate the public into knowing who is doing the best or not? Because they should just be doing it anyway. They, yeah, they should. But I think if, if we thought we saw a lot of greenwashing 10 years ago, um, hang around for purpose washing. I think mm -hmm. the... Uh, we all read the same bird surveys, you know, in Cone Communication out of Boston, their last survey told us that, you know, 88% of millennials want to work for a company or buy a product that has a positive social impact. Yeah. Now, you, you can ignore 88% of millennials if you like, but you'd be a bit silly to do so. <laughs> and you go, and is that 88 going to go down to 60 or will it turn into 90? And you go, it's, it's going to increase, there's no doubt about that. So I think every company is saying, well, we, you know, we care. Uh, and 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 hopefully that's true. Yeah. Um, so sort of say, how do you how do you decipher what's good and bad? Because there were people that uh, you know when uh, climate change became when people well most people accept that it's a reality and and business was saying well we care about that. You sort of go actually some of them it was greenwashing. It was just a, it was a joke. And so we have to be careful as a society that purpose washing we just don't believe companies. Um, because they tell us they can. Well, an example of that is a bottle of water company saying, I'm going to sell you a bottle of water, right? And I'm also going to give a bottle of water to someone in Africa and we're going to do good, right? And that's yes. almost, that's purpose washing and, and then Green's just ignored in the whole picture because I'm giving, selling a bottle of water and giving a bottle of water away. Yeah, not doing anything with the waste from it and leaving in a country so, where they probably don't have a waste system to even deal with it. Correct. So, it's sort of, so yeah, we have to, we have to be... Um, always cautiously opt optimistic, um, but make sure that we sort of, and I think this is where um, having a certification, again, I, I guess it's... Like, like a purpose certification? So it's like Tom's like, certified? Yeah, B Corps. B -Corps. Oh, okay, B Corps, okay. What, what B Corps, <laughs> Didn't you pick that segue up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> set it up beautifully. Uh, the, the, I think the thing I love about, um, again, there's three people that want to make a difference in the world. If we were all put into separate rooms and we'd never met, um, our, our, our doing good stuff would all be different. Like, yeah. There would certainly be an overlap. But there's really no roadmap, is there? And you sort of go, I think the, lo the lovely thing about the, the B Corp community is that there is, it does provide an assessment tool, which is totally free of charge. Yeah. Uh, 
and, and my dream is not for all companies to become a B Corp, but for all companies to uh, to understand that they can use their business for good. Yeah. And, and our role in the, in the B Corp community is to find companies that are good and to shine the light on them um, so other people are inspired uh, to make change. Mm-hmm. And a, a bit like Tom's did. Tom isn't a B Corp, but it's certainly very committed to the purpose. So it's... Um, and why isn't it a B Corp? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a good question. It's, uh, I think the, there's certainly an internal desire to become one. I yep. haven't talked to, you know, play, uh, and as you can imagine, over the last six years, I've talked to everyone in the building about becoming a B Corp. And there's certainly, yeah, yeah we, we, uh, we are committed to use our purpose, our business, uh, to provide positive outcomes. Um, and we see B Corp as a, uh, as a successful way of doing that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's not the only way. You know, Blake uh, with Richard Branson and others uh, uh, started the B, um, oh, it's out of Europe, um, the B Community, I think it was called. B Team? Uh, no, sorry, the B Team. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Jochen Zeitz, uh, all those guys, you know, yeah. and, and very influential, very important people that. Um, have made commitments to to uh, become carbon neutral by 2050. And what's the difference between a B team and a B corp? The way I see it uh, is that they both have the same. They both want to use their business for good. One provides an assessment, and one doesn't. Okay. Um, and and the I think the really lovely thing is that when the B team started, it was it was very much embraced by the the B corp community and B lab to sort of say, hey, look. We, we, it's not an us versus them. This, there's no right way or wrong way to do this. It's about coll- a true collaboration piece. And yeah. it's interesting now the B team use the B Corp assessment tool. Um, oh, interesting. To, to, to provide a, They stole it or they actually <laughs> use it? They, sorry, what Did they that? steal it or do they actually use it? <laughs> it's, the, it's there to be used by all. You can't oh, okay. something free. <laughs> Steal like an artist, Picasso. <laughs> It's, um, and I think this is this is a really and it, it fills um, it fills me with just so much enthusiasm and and positive thoughts because when you look at uh, using your business for good and when you look at the space I look I use Nike as an example you know it's a tr- who are a very competitive company yeah you know, and a very successful company. but in uh, you know Hannah Jones and her team. A truly collaborative. Anything they learn, they'll share. As Patagonia do, a bond yeah. share. And, uh, yeah. you know, he's my idol. I put him up there, and, and I revere the ground he walked on because it, it's sort of they are true uh, changes. They're, they're people who make the world a better place through collaboration, yeah. not through keeping secrets and all that. And I think that's where this is a really inspiring place because um, the B team, B Corp, the, the, the community at whole, it's not. A competitive space. It's a it's a learning space where we all have an obligation to help each other. And you would hope by 2050 that that that, that would be recognised as opposed to being cutting edge um, or um, early adopters. It's just you cannot have a business. And I think this is starting to happen now. Unless your business has a a unique selling proposition, which is almost unheard of these days, it was probably more likely in the 80s. You sort of go now. It's about if you don't. Do things that are good for the uh, for people, profit, and planet. I, I know I wouldn't buy. It. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't. I just I, I wouldn't think of buying. And I think the consumer, the buying triggers uh, are no longer early adopters. It's say eighty eight percent of millennials who represent almost half the workforce. You know, it's sort of it, it'll just become normal. The business is there to make the world a better place. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Is that why? Like, I mean, just for a bit of a backstory for everyone, what is your involvement with B Corp and that whole collaborative and educational realm? Is that why you got involved? I, I was fortunate enough, I, I mentioned uh, briefly before that um, I, uh, I started a company called M1. I was a general manager for the company in Australia, uh, which was a basketball company, very cool, um, all that sort of everything I'm not. Um, but it was, uh, it was great. It was the first time I'd introduced a brand into Australia. And two of the founders were Jay and Bart, who were the two founders of B Corp. Terrific people um, that I feel privileged to call my friends. And I really got to know them quite well at the, in the M1 uh, community. And when I left that, uh, we re- remained friends. And in fact, both of them and their wives had come down 
and we sailed the Sundays together and just, you know, legendary people, I love them. And, uh, and so when they started the, the B Lab and sort of said, yeah, we, we want to use business for good, and there was a lot of strong learnings from that from when they sold and won. I sort of said to them, you know, whatever I can do, I, I, I'd love to, to be involved because I was on that journey, I guess, as an individual. Um, and it just sort of happened that, you know, when uh, when uh, Small Giants sort of started the, the ball rolling in uh, Australia, uh, in a very short time frame, I was actually a lecturer and someone got up and started talking about the B-Lab community. I thought, oh, they're my mates. And, I, and, uh, and yeah, so I sort of I became a founding board member and... and uh, We've been on board for, I guess, four or five years in Australia. It's been 10 years uh, globally. And Amazing. It's a, it's a lovely group. Hmm. Who else is on it with you? Apart it's from a, Jay and Bar. Um, all just independent people that sort of care. There's a couple, as I say, Small Giants were very instrumental in the what, start. What is Small Giants, sorry? They're, it's a... a it's owned uh, by uh, a private company and their investors um, and people that certainly walk the walk. You know, they okay. all their businesses sort of give back and all that. Uh, Dan- Danny Armagall uh, and his wife um, sort of own that. And, uh, and they saw the B Corp uh, story and loved it. And, uh, and so um, while Danny's not on the board, Maliani, who works for him, is the chairperson. And, uh, and we have... I think about seven or eight board members, but from quite diverse uh, backgrounds. Yeah. Um, all wanting to to um, to help the the B Corp community um, become bigger. Yeah. And uh, and to shine a light on people doing good stuff. And so, do you have like B Corp meetups or whatever across Australia and all sorts, or how's it sort of work? Yeah, oh, you do. We, we had we had our, uh, a global meeting last April in Alice yeah. Springs, and. Um, and that was that was inspiring. As it is, you know, when you when good people all get together with yeah. a, a true a true intention of of um, of making the world a better place through their business, the amount of energy and camaraderie that that builds is is uh, inspiring and sort of. And I, you know, through those through my B Corp community, I'm sure that's where my future will lay. I, I think uh, I've met so many smart, good people that are just doing so many good things around the world. Um, which is why I'm hopping on a plane this second week of January to go and talk to one of them and see if we can't do something great in Australia with what they're currently doing. Nice. Yeah, which will be great. So, no, it's a very inspiring community. And as I say, it's sort of our intention is not to make everyone a B Corp. It's just really to, to, to find companies that are doing good stuff and shine the light on them so that we inspire others and, and, and truly make the world a better place. Yeah. Hey John, like you can see, like see your enthusiasm and hear the enthusiasm in your voice about working and being inspired by people that are doing the right thing or trying to do the right thing. Um, so, when did that start to happen for you? When did you start feeling that or, or want to work in that space? It's um, I, I read Tim Flannery's book about climate change, and I think it's a it was a it's a combination of things. I think it's probably uh, when we were little, we went camping a lot. lot. Um, and so, uh, and, and Dad would probably sort of say, "Well, we couldn't afford anything else." Um, but you know, so we, there were six kids, and uh, and so we we were sort of it, it, it wasn't foreign to us to be out in in the wilderness and and to be in a tent and, and sort of. And then as I grew up, you know, living in Western Australia, particularly I went to Germany, but when I came back to Western Australia, I started surfing, and so you're in the oceans and you go down the Margaret River and. Um, carve it up or whatever um, but you sort of hey, you are this, cool it, it, listen it, to your talk <laughs> yeah all right. you had to see me surf you'd be like, well I, I was actually on a I had a paddle so I think you know what they call guys with paddles and I was one of them it's um but it was great and I, I, so I guess there's always been a connection to the environment um and I, I think all Tim Flannery's book I was sort of married I had two kids and and life is just goes on, and that was a bit of a wake up call. I, I sort of it, it reminded me how precious our earth is, I guess, and and what a uh, horrible um, way we were treating it, you know, and and sort of and it made me sort of think, well, um, we all have an obligation. I think it's very egotistical to think, well, I can change the world, but there's no doubt that uh, if we all think that, the world changes significantly very quickly. Um, so the um, so I, I decided then that I would sort of try and play my part, I guess. Um, and the learnings have been significant. I think when I first 
really embraced uh, climate change, uh, I became unbelievably scared. Uh, I became sad. I thought the world was, I thought the human race was horrible. Um, and how could we be doing this? And I went around and I sort of, I was working for Nike at the time and I was chairing their environmental group and Nike are a great company and sort of chairing their environmental group, I guess opened up some doors for me. So I felt it was my obligation to go around and tell every business that we are hitting tipping points. You know, the thermofrost is gonna melt soon and all that carbon is going to the atmosphere. And when that happens, I'll tell you, there's a different world. And so, and after two years, and while all that's true, um, I just felt sad, you know, and I thought, and, and I wasn't me, I, I sort of thrive on positive energy, and all I was doing was going around and polarizing people, mm -hmm. uh, you were either for me or against me, and I would talk for an hour and a half about climate change, and then people would just either say, mate, you're, you're absolutely right, give me a hug, or that, you know, I'm, ha I'm proud to eat meat every day, and, you know, don't tell me I can't, and you go, um, so I, I sort of changed tacks, and it sort of, it was interesting. I was I was at a uh, a weekend at Brown Mountain, um, which is um, uh, seventy kilometres inland of Orbost in Gippsland, and uh, and Cathy and I went there to protest against the potteroos that they'd found in the logging thing, and so all these sort of uh, you know God love them greenies uh, were there, and we're all protesting, and uh, I guess people would see me as a greenie or whatever, but it was a very defining weekend for me because. I sort of drive up, I've got a nice car, which um, I, I made too much money one year at Nike and went out and bought myself a, a nice hybrid Lexus, which is great. <laughs> and, and I still have it, mind you, 11 years later. No. Uh, so it's, I, don't, I don't turn cars over all that often, but yeah, I had a nice car, and, you know, it was electric and all that sort of stuff. And so I, I remember distinctly when we, we drove up, everyone was wondering, like, who's this dude in the nice car? You know? so, <laughs> You know, we've got Dreddies, which we've had now for six years, pretty proud of him. And he's got short hair and he hasn't got a beard. You like, don't fit the stereotype. Exactly. And, <laughs> I it, and, and, as, as, and, and we actually, it was very funny, on the, it was my wife's birthday on the second night, and, uh, and here's all these young kids and blah, 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 and we're sort of slightly older. And we got told off the next morning by making too much noise, like there was one people. <laughs> and I loved it. So the captain still got the rebel in me. But I thought, <laughs> I think, and I, I think environmentalists, um, and I don't want to tar everyone with the same brush because, but I think there's a role to play, uh, that they have a role to play to make sure that society is aware of the issues. I think a lot of them have no desire to change. Like they want to change it, but it's a radical change. Yeah. And, I, and, and God love them for it. I, I look at guys like Bob Brown and that. I just, I, if he was here, I'd cuddle him. You know, I, I paddled down the Franklin River, and I'm so proud that he made us all aware of that. You know, many years ago, and and changed the way we thought about conserving the landscape. So they're absolutely necessary today, as as much as they were then. But for me, I thought actually that's not my role. I sort of I, I've been lucky enough that I've worked for some great companies and um, and and have been sort of moderately successful in them and um, and that's my role I think is to, to be the conduit um, between the radical um, and and business and to sort of say actually this is important enough for us to work together this is not you know early adopter screaming hippie you know never had a job that sort of stuff you sort of no 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 this is everyone. Whether you've got a job, whether you're a CEO of a company, we cannot ignore it. Well, we can, but we, we're we seeing the outcomes of that now. And you go, so together we have to, and I guess the, the, the role we all have to play is to say, work out what your skill set is and don't become someone that you're not, but make sure that with the skill set you've got, you do something today that has a positive impact. And if everyone did that, we would, we would fix this problem really quickly, I think. What people tend to do, including me at times, is look at the totality of the problem and just get sad. Mm -hmm. And and you go, but if actually if I if I walk down, I tend to live my life flying at thirty thousand feet, looking down on the ground. But I think in this space, to truly make a difference, you have to walk on the ground, and you have to understand that while your impact is limited, there is an impact, both positive and negative. So be responsible for it every day. Yeah, I totally agree. That's how you know my thought processes had to change over the last few years myself being in this space and 
just knowing that by you doing those little things, you might not feel it's making a difference, but it makes a huge difference, especially to the people around you, because you're setting this really cool example and people can watch from a distance and be subconsciously changed, which is really cool. Absolutely. Don't you think though, just on a different thought and to go against you, like 50% of the world had been marketed to that the world is bad, everything's ending, we should, you know, go campaign and stop this. And then 50% of the world probably think that technology is going to save us. Business will make a new product. We'll make a shoe that lasts forever with technology enabled that comes all the way back to us. Um, it's just going to take a time and we'll hit a tipping point. And then, so you've got essentially two groups, if you wanted to generalize them. Half that just think the world's ending and they're going to campaign against it, which is no different maybe to like nuclear back in the 60s or whatever it was. Except now they're saying it's the oceans and food. And then 50% who think everything's going to be better because we're going to have, you know, meat grown in Pepsi dishes that are grown down the street where you can grow at your own home. You're going to have shoes that you can recycle at your own home. Like, those are the two arguments, right? And maybe business actually makes the world a better place that maybe in 2050 we're not even talking about this stuff because it's irrelevant. Like, we're not really talking about nuclear now because it's irrelevant. Or do you think it is still relevant in 250 because of these radical people or because of business? I've certainly, look, I'm not a smart bloke and I can't really tell you what, what role nuclear will play in 2050. It's still relevant today, though, you know, with yeah. what's going on and all that sort of stuff. I think the, uh, the I, I, I think I, I, the people I don't meet aren't sort of thinking that technology will change this. I think mindset changes things. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, it's becoming more obvious. I, I, I accept that in the 80s, we sort of, I don't know, maybe we threw stuff out of the car and didn't even think about the repercussions. Um, but today, if you're throwing stuff out of the car, you think, really? It's sort of, I think society's evolved enough to, to see the impact of, of the changes that we've made, particularly yeah. since, you know, the Industrial Revolution. You sort of say, there's significant, and I think, you know, climate change is influenced by man. It's not caused by man. You sort of get go, it's a natural phenomenon. There's no doubt about that. And that's where all the argument comes in. <laughs> yeah. is how much is caused by us now. And you go, it's almost irrelevant. You sort of go, but there's no doubt that our species is having a really huge effect on the world. And I think people are cognizant of that now. It's just the process of fixing it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's, but I, I, it would be, I don't think I've ever met a person say, well, technology will fix this. I think it's a commitment to to work, uh, to truly, as I was saying about businesses now, truly collaborating. I think it's about us understanding that we're part of an ecosystem and we don't own it. Well, I think, I think this is a good point, which I'm going to tie back, is that, you know, a, a Steve Jobs philosophy of the world was that you didn't give money to charity and you just made a product so remarkable that everyone used it and you influenced everyone, right? And then, but the second thought was, you know, Microsoft would be that you made a product, you make enough money, you give some to charity and you make the world a better place. And isn't it, and if you thought about technology, couldn't that be the same way that you build products that are so remarkable that naturally makes the world a better place that you didn't actually have to give something back in a Tom's like scenario or purposeful scenario? Yeah, but I think if, let's, let's look at both of them. You sort of go, if, uh, and you look at Bill Gates and you go, the amount of, Money that he's gone, he's given back to philanthropic causes is just remarkable, and he and his wife should be congratulated. But you sort of, but then you sort of go, but he's he's sort of giving away the outcome, and and you go on the journey of building those computers. Was the mindset I will use my business as a force for good and make the world a better place in the development of my product? And I don't know the answer. You'd have to go and ask Bill. Yeah. But I would suggest that he's become more philanthropic. Once he's achieved his success, yeah, that came go, after. I think I think business now, um, the 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 way you do it is as important as the outcomes. You, I don't think we have the luxury anymore to say, you know what, we'll use really cheap labour, we'll get these shoes made really really cheap. We're going to do it unethically. Oh, but at the end of the day, we'll give a pair for everyone you sell. You can't do that. So mm-hmm. you have to go through and say, okay. You know, we have to pay people properly. We have to have a code of ethics. We have to do all of these things. And I think that's just going to become stronger and stronger. And now, so, so that would be my comment about Microsoft. And the one about um, uh, Steve Jobs, and again, this is just you know, my, I, I'm sort of, I'm in the world of bloody uh, 
I made the decision a while ago because apparently all cool people got Apple, so I just sort of, you know, I'm that, I'm that pathetic that I just went down that road. <laughs> and so I, I now have, you know, everything I do is Apple. But I, I look at it and I go, I'm slightly saddened that when they bring out a new phone, I just can't plug in upgrades because this phone, I've had it, I don't know, uh, maybe two or three years. It seems good to me. But if I really want the latest one, I have to buy the new one. And they change that plug all the time. Every time I change my phone, and I go, you know what, Apple, I'm starting to get a little bit jaded with you because yeah. you, you, you're not you're giving me product that I like. But the balance now is that are you truly caring about the environment and how you're manufacturing? And I question that they are. And so as a, I was an avid supporter five years ago. I'm a reluctant buyer now. In mm-hmm. fact, I don't buy. It. Yeah. But, then, but I, I would consider changing, except that. It's, you know, There's nothing else so remarkable, is it? The, the, and, but do you also think part of this change is, one, we've got more money, and then two, uh, access to build something compared to the industrialized age where you have to build a factory that made all the shoes has changed, that you can actually go build this shoe down the street or in China, and you, all you need is your computer. You don't actually need a factory now or even to visit China. Do you think that's part of it? And so people actually just have to change if you want to be part of it, even be in the market because anyone can buy the shoe from China. The two comments I'll make is that you know, as we've got more money, it's interesting that um, if you're going to talk about a global village, there's some people with more money and a lot with less. Um, all, all bet that the uh, poverty is getting less, I accept that, but the, the ratio between rich and poor is, is being divided. So I sort of think that's one comment. And also, as we're evolving to becoming more, uh, you know, we, we can do things ourselves, our, our footprint's still getting worse. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, I think you know, it'd have to be unbelievable technology. But if you look at the really smart people in the world, they're all talking about going to space. Yeah. Mm. Um, and you go, and uh, which I think... Have you bought a ticket good. yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not great on height. Um, and, and I have no desire to go to space. Above 30,000 feet anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I, can do, I can do 40 quite well. I'd like to actually, from a, a, you know, it makes no difference to anything, I probably would like to go to space, it'd be cool. But yeah. you sort of go, I think we've got bigger issues. I really think that um, as, as the population gets bigger, which is probably one thing we haven't talked about, which is a significant issue, particularly if we keep our uh, footprint up like it is now, um, there's going to not only if, if we today didn't have any more population, but uh, the Indian population used as much carbon as the Australian population did, we'd have significant, you know, there'd be a lot of problems, yeah. as it would be in China and all that. And you sort of, and the, the really sad thing is that as they become more affluent, they look at our world and go, I want to be like you. Yeah. And, and they eat our food and all that sort of stuff, which is why they're having more heart attacks and getting better. <laughs> And, and we should be, as we evolve, we should be looking at them saying, we want to be like you. Um, you know, we shouldn't eat as much meat as we can, should, and we should eat more vegetables and all that. And it's just, we're going the wrong direction. It's, um, so it's, Do you think marketing changes that, or does actual products and systems change that? I always, and just to give you a bit of context, I always remember um, they bought out potatoes in England, and no one would eat the potatoes, and so the Queen tried to work out how she'd sell potatoes. And she put a potato patch in front of her, you know, castle and then put a security guard around the potato patch and everyone walked past and said, what is that? And they said, oh, it's potatoes. And so people started thinking, I want potatoes too. Do you think in that same story sense, actually, you can market and influence the Indian community to do that regardless? And it's just that, that no one's marketed to them in the right way yet. I think so. The benefit of the potatoes got if you, you roast it, my God, how nice is it? It's, <laughs> yeah. It's awesome to eat. So you, I think you can sort of market as much as you like, but if you eat a raw potato, yeah. you know, I don't care how much you market that, mate. I, I own it the raw. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there's a balance of both. I think you sort of say there has to be legitimacy behind what you're marketing. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's And I think it is broader than marketing. I think it's doing. Um, which is which is so it's not just pitching, which I think uh, cynically people would say you know market has just created a need that maybe you didn't even know that you had that need and then they get you to buy stuff you probably didn't even need and it's far broader than that I think the well I I I uh, 
you know, your story has relevance. Um, but I think the end result has to be more than just a, a marketing pitch. Mm-hmm. It has to be a product like Apple that we keep on buying because it's so yeah. good and there's nothing else as good as it. But I think it's interesting that the the the, uh, the only way we get people to, to do things is to engage with them. Okay, and then once you're engaged with people, then you can inspire them to change. And I think one of the handbrakes for engagement is the language that we use. Yeah. Uh, and I, I sort of, and I, I found this very much when I was sort of at my uh, high energy days of climate change. Um, not that I haven't got energy for it now, I just do it in a different way. Um, but I, you know, when I rang up CEOs to try and get to their uh, to their leadership team to talk to them about how they had an obligation to make the world a better place, if I used the word green, um, straight away they'd sort of you know they just they'd categorise me. Yeah, yeah, mate, mm-hmm. pretty busy. You've got a business. To run. <laughs> we have got someone in this building somewhere um, who cares about the environment. Yeah, who cares about the environment. Yeah. Have a chat with because you, you'll have a lot in common. The yeah. token guy with the reusable water bottle. It's funny, I can even relate that back to my business, you know, where you, you know, we're getting rid of single-use plastic out of major events, and the minute we say, you know, we'll get rid of single-use plastic, we'll automatically <laughs> bypass it, but if we say to the event, you're going to save a lot of money and make a lot of money, then the CEO is straight into it, or the commercial manager, and you've got the deal done. <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. So I think we've just got to be, you know, to truly engage the world and to engage every business, we have to use language which engages everyone and what language is that it's smart language give us some examples give us your, what would, give what us would your you answer. say to the ceo rather than saying green what would you go say well i use the word smart yeah and that's and it's an acronym but I, I sort of so if i ring up i'll give you two two things i sort of i ring up so g'day i'm john elliott i work for nike uh i chair their environmental group so you drop the word nike they think that you know that's good and and then you go uh, i work for their environmental group you know we've, we've done some really cool things Straight away, they've made a decision. You're either in or you're out. Because of the environmental word? It's because of the environmental word. Yeah. They might have liked the Nike thing. They think, oh, I can get a free pair of shoes off this dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or whatever. Um, so that still might be an okay. okay. But as soon as I use the word environment or sustainable, I lose them. Yeah. So it's exactly the same focus. I said, I'm John Elliott. I've been working work for Nike for a couple of years. And we've incorporated some really smart business principles that have been outstanding for our business, and I'd love to share them with you. Now, if you say no to something smart, it makes you look dumb. Yeah. And this is, a, 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 I think, this is probably more a male comment than a female comment, but if you, if blokes don't like looking dumb. And I know we <laughs> We're guilt, females do. So I think by using that word, I sort of thought, actually, I get traction 100% of the time by using the smart word. And I thought, okay, what, do I do? what do I do with smart? Because I don't, I just don't want it to sound like I'm smart because that's certainly not the case. But you sort of go, but how then do I, once I've got the door open and I'm sitting down and think, then I can explain smart. And so I, so I will. So smart <laughs> is uh, an, an acronym. And I think this is a Nike thing. They sort of, uh, the, the last thing the world needs another acronym, but never mind. So the S is for sustainable. And my definition of sustainability, which I think needs to be defined because everyone uses it in so many different ways, I call it an equilibrium of people, profit, and planet. Okay. I don't, think it, I don't think it's a true balance. But as, and I, I quite like the word equilibrium because in in uh, you know in the world uh, or in biology, it is an equilibrium, isn't it? Yeah. So it peaks and troughs. Yeah. And so I think that for me is sustainability. Uh, M is for motivational. I think. Again, if we sort of if we're sort of saying we want to change the world together, you go Phew, pretty lofty uh, goal. Um, oh, sorry, no, that's that's A. M is motivational. <laughs> so <laughs> get ahead of myself. <laughs> My brain work. So M is motivational because we have to we have to motivate others to to come with us and and to inspire them to to incorporate change and all that. A is for achievable because I think sometimes the goal is quite lofty and it's really important to celebrate. Um, achievable goals so you know if you do want to make the world a better place through business you go okay how and then bring it back to achievable goals and reward yourself and acknowledge that you've achieved uh, you're taking the steps in the right direction 
R is for, which I changed when I first came up with it, it used to be uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> then I read a Bob Sherinard's second book, <laughs> A Responsible Company, and I changed it straight away because I'd never liked those three. I thought it was a bit wordy. So R is just for responsible. If you haven't read a Bob's book, you should. It's a Bob? Yvonne Av- Avon. 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 Okay. yeah Avon. it's awesome Avon. let my people yeah. go surfing it's a n- great yeah. book nice that, his second book is called A Responsible Company oh there you go yeah and so and that's really a 40 year history of Patagonia and what he's learnt okay. so you can have 40 years of a great mind just by reading his book and you go <laughs> it's a really nice roadmap for any business to read and, and it's, he basically says that we can't say we don't do harm we just have to be responsible for our for what we do um, so that's uh, and C is transforming because we, you know, we, we're currently where we are, but we have to transform into a better society and a better species and, and make the world a better place. So that's smart. Um, and so I think by using that terminology, it, it's hard for people to say no to you. And it's been uh, well received when you've used it to get in the door. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I I, um, I was at Stain- Sustainability in Victoria. Oh God. Maybe four years ago or something, when I sort of thought it's the it's the length. Actually, it was a lot more than four years ago. How time flies! It was um, about twelve years ago, um, and and I was I, I came up with this smart sort of thing, and I was telling uh, one of the guys there, and he said, "Oh, do you mind if we use that?" And I said, "Mate, I don't care. Everyone should use it, you know." So, and I went up there next year for a, a thing, and they had like smart outcomes. I thought, "Oh, yes, that's awesome." So, you sort of, I think we're seeing the word smart more and more. Maybe not the same acronym and all yeah. that, but I—it's not mine to license. It's sort of, I, you know, I, I quite like it. I use it a lot. And if anyone wants to pitch it and run with it, go for it, because it, it's truly—it's not about me making a difference. It's about us making a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to share. It. Every single tool that you got in your in your case together, because um, to keep anything stupid, like why, why, why would you? Yeah, well, yeah. Consider it pinched. I've taken it. Good. Well, <laughs> All right. well, John. So we're on this theme of twenty fifty. What do you think the world's going to look like in twenty fifty? It'll um, it'll be a lot. More, there'll be a lot more people, hey. <laughs> to what there is, so uh, a lot more populated. Um, we'll we'll have to have come. I, I think we would have reached so many tipping points from a, a environmental viewpoint that you would think there'll be significant change. Um, but uh, to to your point before, I think technology, uh, you know, uh, it'll it'll be required to change. We're already seeing that with cars now that we're using. You know, hydrogen, and we're using electricity and all that sort of stuff. Um, albeit, you know, for, for people that are passionate about climate change, it never happens quick enough. But um, but out of necessity, we know um, the invention comes. And as it becomes more and more obvious, and we stop arguing whether climate change is real, you sort of go as we reach certain things. Um, I, I think society will cope better. It's just a, for me. It's a shame we're not doing it now because it's just an easier problem to fix. Um, but what we'll look like, I think it'll, we'll, we'll just have to have, we'll have to be more cognizant that we can't work against Mother Earth. Will, will um, you be giving a coffee and a compostable cup? I, uh, well, I don't. I don't have takeaway cups. Oh, there we go. High five. Yeah. Will, 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 your, will our shoes have RFID t- chips or technology enabled shoes? So it's sort of you know, and you sort of go, well, people have technology chips in them, and I don't know, anything's possible, isn't it? That would really help for all the shoes that wash up on the beach. We could find out who their damn owners are, <laughs> and shoot them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that we could take the population down. I'm, I'm, I'm saying yes. Um, the uh, yeah, look, I, I think. Will we still be drinking Coca Cola? Oh no! I don't, the last time I ever used Coca Cola was to show someone what it did to a two cent coin. So it's obviously a while. That was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since I've had Coke, but it's. Um, it, it, I think. Yeah, I, I just think we will. Uh, we'll be. We'll, we'll have to be more aware um, that we we're all connected to each other. I don't think we'll have this. Oh, I'm Australian. You're New Zealander, and you know. You sort of say there will be a, a true community uh, global community and there'll be lots of challenges with that which we're seeing already you sort of there wherever we create conflict 
people don't want to or can't live there anymore. Yeah. Um, and so they, they, they want to move all around the world. And, and, and if I could choose any place to live, I'd live in Australia. Um, so, Melbourne? Um, I, and, Mel, Mel, honestly, I could live here. And I prefer Melbourne, but yeah. you're just a fussy bastard if you can't live anywhere. It's yeah. like, it's like, cause all of them have uh, lovely points about, and New Zealand the same, you know, sort of, but we, um, I, I just think we, we just have to, we, we have to accept that uh, we, we should share the luck and have some a quality of, of uh, wealth. Um, and I think that will come in time, um, but it, it obviously is taking a long time. And if you if you live in um, Africa, um, you're probably sick of waiting. You know? yeah. so, mm-hmm. so what obligation do we have to try and change that quickly? And you go, I think it will change in course. Like we can already see the transition from China to India. Um, and then it'll happen in India to, to Africa um, because a lot of what we, and this is what you were talking about before, you know, a lot of, if you make a pair of shoes, the average pair of shoes, and I'm not sure if this is true for Tom's, but the average pair of shoes uh, goes through 22 sets of hands. You so, you know, the cost of manufacture is really, really high. Will that be gone by 2050? Possibly. Yeah. Will it be different? Possibly. But you sort of go, it's, um, but will there be an equality of, of, uh, of of wealth uh, amongst the world. I would hope by 2050 the answer would be yes. And then we're going to have to knuckle down and say, okay, how do we feed this community? Yeah. You know, if, the, if there's 14 B in office rather than seven, um, we, we better stop um, giving all that grain to cows. Technology so, will save us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, John, it's been great to chat. You've got a lot of ideas and it's it's been useful, especially the whole purpose of business. Um, how we should be talking to CEOs rather than having dreads in our hair, get our hair shaved and have a, sh- you know, <laughs> put on some glasses and say smart. Um, it's great. Yeah, yeah kind of well, And I think, as I say, I, I really, I, I, I'm not down on grannies. I love them to death. They have their role to play. And I guess the point of that is that if, if we don't all have to play the same role, otherwise it's just do what's natural to you. You know, yeah. you, obviously you've both got circles of influence which you use well yeah. um, so, and, 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 and you're doing something positive to change it so I, I sort of think that's awesome and if you ever get to a stage where you do have a global presence yeah. you know, what, what a privilege and an honour that would be but it's not necessary to change do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. The, the, biggest, the biggest threat we have to not making the world a better place is for people feeling daunted about what they or how they can do things and you go if we all do something today, and we're doing, like tomorrow, we're, we're taking the day off and just hanging out with Sea Shepherd and cleaning up a little bridge at Morty Alec, and you go, will that change the world? No, it won't. But will it, it Will it make other companies think, well, maybe we should take one day off a year just to go and help others, even though we're a helping company. And I think it's through that, you know, not by saying, oh, yeah, no, aren't we great, but just by providing practical examples so other people go, wow, that's cool. It's sort of, And to be honest, I'm really excited not to, come to the office for the day. Great. <laughs> Living the dream. Pick up stuff on the beach. And sort of, it'd be better off if there was nothing on the beach and hopefully that in 2050 we'll go down to the beach and... Have a beer. We'll find, or we'll find a sand. Like yeah. Sort of fish swimming in the ocean. I love it. Cool. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, that was awesome. You're a legend. Thanks, John. Absolute, no, absolute pleasure. And I just... It's, it, it, if, uh, if we're going to stop recording maybe for a second or whatever I didn't realise at the start that the start would be me about drinking red wine <laughs> <laughs> let's see how that sounds well we, we think it sounds really good if you're happy with it <laughs> people that know me well know that I drink too much red wine. that's alright you only had six bottles that night it wasn't seven I should have said it wasn't just me like there's ten people there I didn't drink that <laughs> Sure, sure. You were just getting prepped for today. It's okay. <laughs> All right, well, lovely to chat. That's yeah, good. thanks so much, John. It was great. the work you're doing. It's sort of, it's, it's, um, it's bloody awesome. Oh, likewise. Well, if you have anyone else you think we should interview, just let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Have you talked to, it's it interesting, um, we're not recording this now, are we? No. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I met Daniel from Thank You. Yeah. Have you met him? No. He's, uh, he, I tried to... Uh, I had a. I, I really think that for profit businesses, and uh, let me step back a bit. The great thing about Tom's is that all we concentrate is the outcomes. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, you buy a pair, we'll give a pair. And some people do say to me, so what's that cost? Now, what's the cost of that pair of shoes? And you say, well, and I use the analogy in Australia. So we give shoes in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy, just down the corner, um, and we give shoes in Kalinara. Now, which one do you reckon costs more? They go, oh, shit, it must cost you a fortune to get it to Kalinara. And you go, yeah, it does. So it's cheaper to give in Brunswick. So I think that's a really nice way of sort of saying it, it, it doesn't matter about the cost. It's really the outcomes that are important. And the problem I have with non-for-profits yeah. is that we give 100% of our profits to the cause. And you go, awesome. First question, were you profitable in your first year? And they, oh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. So, okay, but if you're not profitable, does that mean you do nothing? Exactly. And you go, okay. And I said to Daniel, I said, so without being rude, I said, but I have an inquisitive mind. How much do you pay yourself? He goes, I'm not telling you that. I said, why not? Yeah, why would you not be transparent? Yeah, because I want to know, because you're now making money the issue. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you're going to give 100%. It's an absolutely logical... And I said to him, Daniel, I really like you. I bought your freaking book. I think what you're doing is great. Um, but I I can have a $10 million business, and if the three of us own it, and I give you $3 million and you $3 million and me $3 million, we've got $1 million left, so we'll give that to charity, eh? Yeah. But if we only get 100000 each, I've got a shitload more to give. And it's a fair question, yeah. I think. I think, yeah, for someone like uh, Thank You, they should be authentic about it, right? It's no different to Steve Jobs saying, I would only take a dollar a year and then everything else is the business. Forget a super yacht and everything else. And then, or John Key in New Zealand saying he's only going to pay himself a dollar a year and the, he's, not, he's going to donate the you know $200,000 income to charity. Um, that, that's authentic, right? But and especially if you have a not-for-profit and you're saying, I'm giving all profits to charity. Yeah. It still is not true. It should be a fully transparent company. Yeah, and I think it's, it's sort of, and I think also to expect that people, you know, John Keyes was in a position and those people are in a position where they can afford it. Yeah. Steve Goffs wasn't on the bones of his ass. He had shit <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so for people like me and for, the, for you know, normal people, you sort of go, well, I have to earn an income. And if, in fact, if my business is really successful, um, as long as there's some criteria, and I think being, uh, the B Corp community, the CEO can't earn any more than uh, a times 10 factor of the lowest employee. So there's sort of a, whether well, that's right or wrong, that's the gauge. You know? yeah. so, you, so at least there's some guidelines in there. Because I think it's unfair, Daniel goes, oh, well, I only pay myself $10,000 a year. So maybe you're an idiot. How do you pay your mortgage? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you should so, probably be saying, I pay myself 100k a year and... X goes to charity. The, but, yeah, but I think even if you look at business and you, you know, and I, I, the, the worst, the worst ones. You look at uh, Australia Post, the guy that left there it was earning five, six million dollars a year or whatever. The, the, the corporate money that's available for very, very good CEOs is significant. Yeah. It's all millions of dollars. Yeah, like Westfield. Yeah, I think West so Farmers pays like himself twelve mil, right? Sorry? West Farmers pays himself twelve million million a year. I think I saw the lot. West Farmers. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. So, so, so this, and you sort of say, oh, but you know, we're a company that cares, and you go, but if I don't know, say if Daniel paid himself eight hundred thousand dollars a year, I have no idea. I would look at that and go, well, shit, he's done a good job, and if if the business can afford it, and the the, the, the thing that's missing in this whole thing is what are your outcomes, Daniel? What are your outcomes? Mm -hmm. And I asked him that, and, and it's sort of almost, no, no, but John, you can trust me, we give 100%. I don't give a fuck about the money, mate. Yeah, no. 100% could be one buck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and how do you feel about selling fucking something that takes four litres of water? Yeah. Like, like, fuck me, don't you think that's Did right? you actually ask him that or no? Yeah, yeah. Because I've always wanted to ask that, him these that, things. Exactly. <laughs> Good, because then we will. <laughs> if we don't do it, if we don't do it, well then Someone else there's will. no good out. All right. And you go, it's, I don't know, it's sort of... He's doing good enough, right? Which in his yeah. mind, and the argument is, is what a good enough isn't good enough. <laughs> and, exactly. But the thing is, that, and I don't even know what they are, I think the really nice thing about a for-profit is that you have a responsibility. We're very outcome-driven. You do this, we will do that on your behalf. And I think... 
it's almost like charities. I, I look at charities like there's a huge void in the market at the moment because historically charities, and you sit around the table with them, which I, I'm on a strategic board of one of them, um, and uh, actually two of them now because um, I'm on the board of Save the Children's retail thing as well. But they tend to be, and this isn't talking about Save Children, but just I, yeah. a, they tend to be holier than now. Now we we are here because we care. Yeah, we're not we're not a business. Uh, we're here to fix you know the world's problems, and we need money to do that. But we're not a business. And you go, okay, I, I get it, because you see business as bad. They're profit making bastards, and we like to sort of keep at arm's distance. It, I find it ironic that they go to the government, put their hand out, and take our money anyhow. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> but you sort of go, but and. When, with my B Corp hat on, I'm talking to seriously big businesses. Now, every business I talk to goes, John, we want to elevate purpose. We need to help people. And you go, well, don't start your own shit because you won't be very good at it because you're really good at doing this. So just do that. But why don't you align with the charity and really mean something to each other? Yeah. And you go, and the charity goes, oh, geez, I don't think I can align myself with a bank. And you go, a bank like a bank like that now makes a million dollars every 15 minutes. By the, you know, this conversation we've had, they've yeah. just made six million bucks. And I you know. go, fuck me, you give them a million dollars to a charity, they can, they can, you know, they run on the smell of an oily rake, but they're not engaging yet. Yeah. No, uh, you're right. I've thought about being the conduit next year for um, actually putting the two together, mm-hmm. just getting all this friggin' money, because banks I, have got... Some- I agree. I think there's opportunity, I think there's even an opportunity for four... Uh, even for you know for good oh, companies okay. like Tom's or whatever to be part of it as well where it's the banks oh, totally. can be collaborative totally. or they uh, they're giving they're giving bank branded shoes or whatever you want to call it to all the kids in Australia and that's part of it and it's free branding it's no different to um, City Bike in New York mm-hmm. for their bike share ne- network where City Bank owns the bike share network right Correct. but there's a very hard process in the middle where both aren't linked up and there's no middle group person, right? Or community. Well, there will be. There'll be John. It's one or the other. But I reckon, yeah, it won't be me. I've got, <laughs> obviously, the, the thing I'm going to do next year, I'm going to make shoes in Australia. Awesome. Oh, cool. Which is my plan. So, and, and I'll make the outsoles out of old shoes. Yeah. Stuff, which has never been done. And before. you found another company that does something similar overseas, is it? Yeah, you know, the company I'm... I shouldn't tell you this because it's in absolute, uh, it's very confidential status, but I'll, I'll just trust yeah. you, so don't fucking tell me. <laughs> 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 the company that I'm using um, actually builds their uh, factories in jails. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. That yeah. seems to be a big thing right now, actually. Mm. Well, there's a lot of talk about it in Australia because we, we just want a lot more people up because, you know, they shouldn't be out parole and blah, 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 which I sort of get, you know, it's sort of, I spent three years in the police force when I was younger, so I, I sort of get that side of it. Yeah. And, but you sort of go, but we can't keep locking people up and just make him turn into shitheads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they just, they generally, as a rule of thumb, people come out of prison. I love it. So they're going to make it all for you. So I've, I've had, had two meetings with the government. Um, the recidivists in Argentina, where they do this, they pay, the idea is we'll pay them a full salary, so award payments. Okay. Payments of which I'll give them 80% and 20% goes back to victims of crime. Okay. Um, and not only will we teach them how to make shoes and also apparel and also bags, like it's limited by your imagination yeah. basically, but they do meditation with them. They oh, okay. Them. Shit, what an integrated model. So not one person, there's been 80 prisoners go through in Argentina, not one of them has gone back to jail. Our resources cool. have is 43%. What a model. And it, it, other, other, sorry, carry on. Sorry, I, I get too excited. <laughs> um, but can you imagine the indigenous community? And you, you sort of go, you know, 30% of our prisoners are indigenous and they represent less than 2% of our population. And if I, again, I'm generalizing, yeah. but a lot of them, you know, mum and dad are alcoholics, they live off welfare. Mm. As soon as they get to teenage, they start sniffing glue, they start doing this, and they just get into the system. And they've never, in their whole life, had a vehicle to add value to. Because exactly. the, white, the white fella gives them money to eat and all that sort of shit. They, they can't get a job because they live in far away communities and if they do come into town, they generally are yeah. drink to, to blah, blah, blah. And you go, so it'll be ironic, but I reckon it, I, I'll be able to grab these kids because I know they'll be, I know where they live. They, they're in yeah, South yeah. Street. <laughs> and you're there for 18 months and you say, come here, little fella, have I got a job for you? Yeah. And by the time they leave, 
they'll have 40 grand in their kit. Yeah. They'll have a sense of pride and purpose, and they can go back to their community. Now, if Argentina is any example, not one of them will go back to jail. No, I'm not that ambitious, but you go, if, if you can get one in 10 and change their life, exactly. feel proud. And I look at the, if I was average, I could tell you that the, 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 um, the 50,000 years of looking and working with Mother Nature, I would be so proud of. The yeah, yeah. It's fucking incredible. And I value that more than they do. And I can tell you, when we go through this, I'll make them proud of their history and I'll make them proud of as being people. So they, they then leave and so we'll start doing it in prison, but then we'll, the government will build factories for me outside of prisons as well. Uh, and they don't, honestly, they're not doing it because I'm a good bloke, but you do the sums. It costs over $200,000 a year to incarcerate one person. Oh, okay. If none of them come back, they're yeah. going to save millions and millions of dollars. So yeah. are, the, are, the, are the prisons privately or publicly public there's companies? Th- the public, there's three in Victoria that are privately owned. Oh, okay. Uh, and all the rest are public. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Interesting. So we're looking at low, uh, medium to low. Uh, and are you looking to work with private ones or public ones? I got to no, I work with uh, public because okay. I get money from the government. Okay, yeah. love it. But only it, it's not you know pedophiles, rapists, murderers. You can go fuck yourself. I don't want anything to do with it. You know what I mean? It's sort yeah. of like bad guys, they're bad. But you sort of go, we've all shit. I reckon before I joined the police force, I could have gone to jail for some of the stupid shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I just didn't get caught. You know, so yeah. there are people that have made mistakes, and they should have the ability to get out of it. So yeah, yeah. So that's I'm I love it. Sure. That's awesome. Uh, if I hadn't got the ass from Tom, so there's always a simple line, right? <laughs> Exactly. Well, you, we'll cool. have to get you on for another one later on down the line when, when it's all up and running. Cool. I probably would have had red wine the night before. We'll see how Excellent. we Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> we can have one during the podcast. It'll be good. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Thanks, John. Stay in touch. And thanks yeah, definitely. We'll be in touch soon. Good on you. You're a legend. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Yeah. Bye.